Uh, this is Escaping Flatland, a romance of data science in the browser. That title is a reference that maybe a few of you get, um, but we'll come back to what it's a reference to later. I'm Jana Beck. I'm a data visualization engineer at a company called Stitch Fix. We're based in San Francisco, California, and we're an online personal styling service. And uh, we only operate right now in the United States, and we launched in the UK last year. And my job there is a pretty unusual role for sort of a JavaScript front-end engineer. I'm on a team of about five people. Of, we're all UI developers supporting a group of about 110 or 120 data scientists. Um, and so what we do is we partner with them kind of as internal consultants and build applications that help them surface their work to their business partners inside the company. So it's all kind of internal tools and a lot of it's data visualization focused. So this is about doing data science in the browser. And in particular, one particular data science technique, which is called dimensionality reduction. Now, you're already familiar with dimensionality reduction. It's a fancy phrase, but maps are dimensionality reduction. And map projections are algorithms for dimensionality reduction of a very specific type. You know, they are designed to take the globe and project it onto a two-dimensional space that you can read as a map. This is a particularly exotic projection called the Waterman's Butterfly, but there are a lot more familiar projections that you've seen before. If we want to do dimensionality reduction more generically and on data sets that are much larger than just three dimensions, then we turn to other types of techniques. And the one I'm going to talk to you about today is called UMAP, uh, Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. We're not going to talk about what that means. Uh, we're just going to use it. And so as I said, this is a general algorithm for taking a high dimensional data set, which just means like columns in a data set. If every item in your data is a row, how many columns are there? Are there? That's how many dimensions there are. So we're going to start with something very concrete and that should be familiar to you as JavaScript and like web developers, RGB colors. That's a three-dimensional uh, data space where each dimension varies from 0 to 255, right? So if we generate a random distribution, or not random, sorry, this is a uniform distribution of data in that space. We get a perfect cube because each side is, varies from 0 to 255. And then this is just an animation showing applying UMAP to that to flatten it out to two dimensions. Um, so this isn't particularly something no anyone would normally do with color spaces, but I think it's a useful intro into what we're talking about with dimensionality reduction. And you can see that um, you get this gradient effect. So when you flatten it out, the things that are similar still end up near each other in the reduced dimensions, which is or an embedding, is what you call it. Um, and, and that's the point of this, to see items in your very, very complex data. Sometimes you have hundreds of dimensions that are actually similar to each other, so seeing clusters. We can also do this with another color space. So this is the HSL space. And we get, again, gradient effect, but a very different result that kind of derives from the original geometry. So the rest of the examples in this talk are going to re uh, revolve around the MNIST hand-drawn digits data set, which is just canonically used um, to test these types of algorithms in data science. So this data set is 10,000 hand-drawn digits, 0 through 9. And you break them up into pixels, um, so 10 by 10 pixel grid. So that means this is a 100-dimensional data set, because we have 100 um, pixels in that grid. So that's breaking it down. And the way this data is represented is if the pixel is completely white, like this one is at 2, 2 for this particular digit, then it's a 0. And then at 3, 2 here, it's almost completely black, so it might be 0.825. It's a value between 0 and 1, depending on how black the pixel is. So this animation, this isn't computing in the browser. This is just an animation to show you what MNIST, uh, what UMAP looks like applied to the MNIST data set. 
um, what are we getting out of this? And what we're getting out of this is um, the clustering to see the numerals that are the same. And then you get a few interesting exceptions, which are human exceptions, right? These are hand-drawn digits. And one of the advantages of UMAP over some of the other um, dimensionality reduction algorithms is that you also get um, clusters appearing close to each other that are sort of similar themselves. Some other dimensionality reduction algorithms, you can't um, infer anything about clusters that are close to each other. You can only infer things about things that are in a cluster. So here, um, the purple, uh, blue, and gray in the lower left, right? Um, those are the, like the nines and the sevens and the fours. So those also have a kind of a similar shape, and so that's why they all cluster together. So coming back to the title of this talk, it comes from this book, Flatland, A Romance of Many Dimensions. It was written by uh, a English schoolmaster named Edwin Abbott Abbott. Uh, and the, uh, the pseudonym that the book was written under is A Square, which actually might be a pun on his name being Abbott Abbott, apparently. And this story is about A Square, the hero, who lives in this space, um, Flatland, which is a two-dimensional universe. And it's populated by other shapes and social classes determined by how many sides you have, and there's a bunch of weird Victorian social satire. But, spoiler alert, the climax of this uh, story is when there's a visitation to Flatland by a sphere. Um, and A Square witnesses this, and it's, his life is forever changed by it. Um, and so I'm using that story as a little bit of a metaphor, maybe a tortured metaphor, but you can decide that, for the browser. I think that we treat the browser a little bit like Flatland. And that's fair. The browser started as something to navigate hyperlinked text documents. Um, images came later. You know, WebGL came way later. But we do have things like WebGL now, and we have things like TensorFlow in JavaScript. And we have implementations of dimensionality reduction algorithms in JavaScript, like this UMAP.js that we'll be looking at. So the browser, we think of it like this, as this flat thing. We kind of think of it as the main thread. But really, what I'm going to try to convince you is that we have the ability to invite visitations by something analogous to these spheres visiting Flatland, which are web workers. That these visitors can kind of come in and out of our apps and expand uh, the dimensionality of what we're able to do in the browser. So if, if any of you aren't familiar with web workers, they are execution context outside of the main context in the browser. Um, they're similar to a browser, you know, they're still JavaScript. You can do XHR requests, um, but you don't have a DOM and you don't have a window object. You do have a global self, but, and it has some of the things that are on the window object, but not everything. All the data transfer between a web worker and the main thread is by message passing. Um, and this data is copied, not shared, and so you have to serialize and deserialize it every time you're passing data back and forth. And so you, there are some limitations on what you can pass back and forth. Basically, the JavaScript primitive types are serializable, so strings, numbers, objects, arrays, dates are, blobs are, array buffers are, but the critical ones that aren't are DOM nodes, instances of error, and functions. Writing a web worker is extremely simple. This is the basic template. It's just an on-message handler. Then you do something with the data that the main app gives passes to your worker, and then you um, use this global post message function to pass back your result. On the app side, you just um, instantiate a worker with, um, you, you have to have it in a separate script, and then you instantiate it uh, with the new keyword. Then uh, on that instantiation, you have a post message method, and that's how you communicate data to your worker, and then you attach your own on-message handler to do something with what comes back. Tool change support is really good. Webpack parcel, I did have problems trying to bundle 
a worker into a roll-up library with their plugin, so I'm not sure about that one. Um, so first demo, and a word here, unfortunately, uh, driving huge external displays like this beautiful display um, did not work with my slide deck that actually has the embedded live code. So what you are seeing is GIFs, and the frame rate is not as high as it would be in real life. There's a link to the slides at the end of this, so I encourage you to come back later. I'll also pin a tweet later today um, to play with the slide deck if you want. Um, GIFs don't really do it justice, but... Um, so in a worker with only 1,000 items, um, I you know, stuck a frame rate meter on here. The frame rate's very high. Uh, 1,000 items is not giving us a great result because you really need a bit more data to do UMAP. Um, in the second demo, what you're going to see is just uh, nothing happening until it's all done, which I forgot to mention. The uh, most dimensionality reduction algorithms of this type that are used for visualization are both non-deterministic and they're iterative. And it can be useful to watch those iterations happen as the algorithm converges on the result. Um, so that's what we are, that's what we were seeing here as things are sort of animating into place. But here, this is when we actually ran the UMAP out in the main thread, not in a worker. It just ends up snapping to the end result pretty much. The frame rate is six frames per second. It's pitiful. Basically, the entire UI was locked up and non-interactive during that time. So now if we bump up the, uh, the N, we start to see the frame rate dropping a little bit, which is mostly a limitation of the compute here. Actually, I'm going to skip through that one, and we'll look at the 5,000 one. And the thing uh, where it says foobar, I put that up there in hopes of doing the live demos. Um, and you will see things happening in the last demo. Um, that, the idea there is to, that I would be typing along with it um, to show you whether the page is interactive or not. And in this one, it wasn't interactive until you actually render all those, um, all those numbers in their random starting locations. And that's because the initial render in the browser is taking considerable resources. But we have some other tools in web workers to make even that initial render um, not block the, the main UI. So transferable objects are also a thing in web workers. And these are the exception to the idea that you only um, pass data back and forth and you're copying. Uh, transferable objects are zero copy. They're basically a pass by reference. Um, so this is kind of simplified from actual code that's embedded in the live version of these slides. Um, we're getting the embedding out of the UMAP library and then um, storing that in a JavaScript typed array, a float32 array. Um, and that's because all typed arrays have an array buffer in, in their buffer property. And a, an array buffer is one of the um, type subset of things that count as transferable objects between web workers and the main app context. So here, when you post message back to the main app, uh, the coordinates are there in this bucket payload. It can look like however you want it to look like. But then there's the second argument that's an array um, that's you're listing the, the typed array dot buffer here again. Uh, to indicate that you want this to be treated like a transferable object. That's what that second argument is for. It's just a list of all the things that you want to um, transfer instead of copy. So it turns out that um, while I am actually doing that with using array buffers for passing the data back and forth, at the scale of data um, that I'm working with, with like 5,000 of the MNIST digits, that doesn't actually affect the performance. Um, it affects performance when you're working with much bigger data sets. But there's one more transferable object that is at the very bleeding edge of what you can do in browsers today, which is off-screen canvas. And this is like the HTML canvas element, except it's not a DOM element, because you can't use DOM elements in web workers. So it's basically an implementation of the canvas API that's not a DOM element. And what's really cool about it is that what you can do is you can render a canvas element, an actual HTML element, in, in your app. Uh, then you, you know, look for it, document query selector, pick it up. And then you call this method transfer control to off screen. 
and then you post it to a worker, and you put it in the, that array of transferable objects, and now you can do your rendering code onto that canvas in a web worker, but it will actually show up in your HTML DOM in the canvas, like visibly, even though you're doing the rendering outside of that context. So there's this like wormhole kind of link between the, uh, the main canvas element in your DOM and the off-screen canvas in the web worker. And then on the worker side, you just pull that canvas out of the message that you got passed and operate on it like any other canvas. It's no different. So the final demo here that I'm going to show you, or recording of a demo, sadly, is um, we're going to have two workers happening now, a render worker that's doing all of the rendering of the actual data visualization uh, using the Canvas API. And then the other worker that we've been using all along to do the compute of the UMAP. So we're actually computing the, every iteration of the UMAP as it converges on the result, passing that data back to the main app, and then posting it to the render worker, which might seem like a lot of passing. But remember, we're, ha we're doing this all through the transferable objects. So it's zero copy. It's very fast. And it, it is way better to do it in two separate workers. Um, I did try doing it in one. And not a good idea. So this is the last one. It's the same um, as what we saw before. 5,000 items. Here I was typing. It was interactive from the very beginning, because even this initial render happened via the render worker. And the reason there's no frame rate meter showing on this demo is because off-screen canvas is so new that a lot of the libraries for doing any of these kinds of things are um, not compatible with off-screen Canvas yet. Most of these libraries assume a window object exists. And so you get problems when you try to use them in web workers. So the frame rate meter that I use is a package called stats.js. Um, and even the earlier demos were actually done not in Canvas, but in 2D WebGL via a library called pixie.js, which is also not quite ready for off-screen Canvas yet, though I think a few people have started hacking it in there. Uh, so that is the lesson I hope that I can teach you today, is that web workers and off-screen canvas can really open up the browser to some like, massive new possibilities in terms of doing heavy computation in the browser and like, let us escape from this browser flatland. Um, if you want to chat, I, as I said, I will pin a tweet to the slide deck. Um, and the slides are there as well if you feel like you can remember it. Thank you.